All right, we're going to uh, continue in our study in the book of Acts, and we're going to pick up uh, in Acts chapter number 25. If you have a notebook, uh, you could go to page 279, 279 in your notebook, and um, we'll pick up uh, the reading, the scriptural reading, and the commentary uh, at that particular point. We've noted in the past, just bringing you up to date on some kind of some factoids from uh, past uh, lessons, that the book of Acts covers about 35 years, and we know that there are some discrepancies as far as exactly what year uh, was Jesus crucified, or was Jesus born, or was Paul, uh, you know, converted, and all those things. There's, there are some differing opinions on that, but nonetheless, those opinions fall generally within three or four years of one another. But 35 years all told is pretty much what the book of Acts covers historically in the early church. It's primarily, as we've said, a book of transitions. There are several transitions in the book. Uh, obviously, the greatest of them is from the ministry of Jesus Christ, then his ascension into heaven, to the ministry of his disciples, of his apostles. There also is the transition from Old to New Testament, from a focus on Israel and the kingdom to the church and to the body of Christ. There is a focus on taking the gospel, as Jesus uh, instructed his disciples in Acts chapter 1, to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. And we see that as we go through this book, the 35 years it covers, we see how the gospel spreads to the uttermost part of the earth. The first part of the book focuses in on the leader named Peter, the apostle Peter, who walked with the Lord Jesus himself, a fisherman. Then from chapter 13 to the end of the book, the main figure uh, is the apostle Paul, who is called Saul, Back in uh, chapters 8 and chapter 9, chapter 13, we see his name is changed from Saul to Paul, and he becomes the main character or figure of the book. In the second half of the book, there are basically five major themes. There are three missionary journeys that Paul took that are recorded there, chapters 13 and 14, 15 through 18, and then 18 through the end of chapter 21, uh, where um, uh, we see that uh, Paul is confronted by a, a group of Jews, and ultimately he is arrested in Jerusalem, and uh, the last part of the book then chronicles Paul's trip to Rome to stand before Caesar because he appealed to Caesar. So we're going to pick up today in uh, chapter number 25, and th again, that's page 279 in your notebooks. Anytime you like, though, you can always go back to the beginning of the notebook on pages uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and you can get a pretty good outline and understanding of where we're, we have been and where we are going in our study. For example, if you went to page number 5, you can see Acts 25, 1 through 27. We put a title on this chapter of Standing in Judgment in Two Worlds. And then we see essentially the uh, uh, headings, the main thoughts that will be covered in this particular uh, chapter. So let's, uh, let's go to our notes, page 279, if you'll turn there with me. Look at the introduction. In Acts chapter 9, the Lord said to Ananias, this is not Ananias and Sapphira. This is another Ananias who uh, went to Paul and actually brought healing to Paul. And Paul, the Bible says, was filled with the Holy Spirit. The Lord said to Ananias, quote, Go thy way, for he, speaking of Paul, is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. The church was called and commissioned to be witnesses of Christ. We've seen the term witness over and over and over in this book many times. Witnesses are people who are called upon 
to tell the truth, to know what they know to be true, and to bring forth information. And that's what we as Christian people are supposed to do. We're supposed to bring forth the truth of the gospel based on what we know from the Word of God. We're to bring that to other people and be witnesses. In chapter 23, the Lord stood by Paul at night to encourage him when he said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also in Rome. So that's just a couple chapters ago, and now uh, Paul is getting an all-expense-paid vacation trip to the city of Rome to stand before the emperor of Rome and uh, plead his case before him. Paul most recently has shared his faith in Christ before the high priest, the Sanhedrin, the Romans, Claudius Lysias, soldiers, Felix, his wife Drusilla, and now Portius Festus, also Herod Agrippa, and soon he will go, as I said before, Augustus Caesar himself. We can see an outline there in the middle of page number 279. Let's pick up our reading in Acts chapter 25, verse number 1. Just uh, by way of uh, just a statement here, these last uh, several chapters really are a narrative. It's not that there's a lot of uh, doctrinal information or things that we need to stop and th talk about and sort out from uh, Romans and Ephesians and Galatians and Old Testament comparisons. Pretty much what we're going to read now from this point on is the story of Paul and how he ended up in Rome. And of course, um, we really don't know how Paul's life ended. Uh, some people say that we today are living in Acts 29, that the book of Acts never really ended. So it just kind of gets cut off there at the end of chapter 28. And uh, we'll see that in uh, a little bit, in uh, three more lessons or so. We'll see the actual termination of the book. But chapter 25, verse 1 says, Now when Festus was come into the province after three days, he ascended from Caesarea, that was the Roman capital in this area, to Jerusalem. That was the Jews' capital. That was their holy city. Then the high priest and the chief of the Jews informed him against Paul and besought him and desired favor against him that he would send for him to Jerusalem, laying wait in the way to kill him. They wanted to bring Paul to Jerusalem and ambush him and kill him on the way. But Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea and that he himself would depart shortly uh, thither or to there. Let them therefore, said he, which among you are able, go down with me and accuse this man, if there be any wickedness in him. And when he had tarried among them more than ten days, he went down to Caesarea, and the next day, sitting on the judgment seat, commanded Paul to be brought. So uh, the Jews have uh, uh, issued forth uh, false accusations, just as they did against the Lord Jesus Christ. He's uh, guilty of... Uh, tradi uh, sedition and treason and uh, you know he's just a big troublemaker and uh, he's creating all kinds of political and social problems for our community and uh, governor you need to do something about this so a lot of false accusations of course when the Roman uh, individuals when the Roman authorities uh, sat down to listen to what the accusations actually were they were theological or uh, accusations that were related specifically to their religious beliefs. They weren't political issues or even social issues. They were theological issues, religious issues. And of course, the, the uh, Roman authorities, they were in no position to judge, you know, who was right and who was wrong in these things. They didn't even see that it was important for them to be involved. So, but nonetheless, God used them to protect Paul from these Jews who wanted to kill him. There in uh, chapter 25, verse 1, at the top of page 280, Festus uh, came into the province, and he replaced the fellow that preceded him. His name was Felix, if you will recall, back in chapter number 24. 
So apparently, historically, Felix had caused significant social unrest himself and had to be, as I put in my notes, cut from the team. He was asked to leave. Pontius Pilate was in a similar situation at the time of the crucifixion of Christ. He had created some problems with the, uh, with the local population, and uh, one of the reasons why he waffled so much at the accusations against Christ was he was afraid to offend the local population and lose his position, just as apparently Felix had lost his. Then the high priest and the chief of the Jews, verse 2, the high priest has been replaced also. According to Daryl Bach in page 700 of his commentary, he says that, uh, that Ananias the high priest has been replaced by a high priest named Ishmael. That's a Bible name, isn't it, from the Old Testament? 25 verse 3, desired favor to send for him to Jerusalem, laying wait in the way. The new high priest would like to get Paul out of Caesarea into Jerusalem, again, to assassinate him. Get him away from these, uh, a Roman, the Roman protection of Caesarea and get him down to Jerusalem where they would have an advantage, they'd have greater opportunity to eliminate Paul. But Festus says, no, no way. He's going to stay right here at Caesarea. Verse 20, uh, chapter 25, verse 7 says, And when he was come, the Jews which came down from Jerusalem stood round about and laid many and grievous complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. While he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, neither against the temple, nor yet against Caesar have I offended anything at all. Their accusations were all, as I said, theological, religious. They were hollow accusations. And uh, the political officials just, uh, they, they didn't take the bait. They didn't see it. So they laid forth all of these complaints. This is kind of a repeat of what happened back in chapter uh, 24. Festus then invites Paul to defend himself. In verse number 9, we pick up the reading, but Festus, willing to do the Jews a pleasure. Again, he's, play, he's playing the odds here. He doesn't, he doesn't want to, a man who is innocent to be unjustly convicted, but at the same time, he want, doesn't want the Jews to think that he's just dismissing their complaints out of hand. So Festus, willing to do the Jews a pleasure, answered Paul and said, Wilt thou go up to Jerusalem, and there be judged of these things before me? Then said Paul, and this is where he makes his appeal, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat. Now as a Roman citizen, Paul the Apostle had the right to make this plea. He could take it all the way, what we would call today, to the Supreme Court. He could take this issue right to the top, to the actual emperor of the Roman Empire and plead his case as a Roman citizen before him. So he says, no thanks. I'd rather go to Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews have I done no wrong as thou very well knowest. And he did. He knew that. For if I be an offender or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not uh, to uh, die. But if there be none of these things whereof the, these accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. This particular verse here in verse 11, where it says, quote, I refuse not to die, end of quote, this leads some people to believe that Paul was pro-capital punishment. Now, that, that may be a stretch, and I'm not saying, <laughs> I'm personally, I believe that capital punishment is, ju can, is justified in certain, certain situations. That's another topic I'm not going to go into now. But some people use this passage as a proof text for capital punishment. And I think what Paul is just saying here, he's saying, listen, if I've done something wrong, you know, I'm, I, I'm willing to take the full shot. The full weight of the law can fall on me. I don't know that he's justifying any kind or degree of punishment here. I think he's just simply saying, hey, if these guys are right and I'm wrong, so be it. I'll take my medicine. However, you know there's nothing wrong here. 
you know that I haven't done anything wrong. For if I be an offender, have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if there be none of these things whereof they accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, Hast thou appealed unto Caesar? Unto Caesar shalt thou go. If that's what you want, then that's what we'll do. Of course, that takes this whole situation out of his hands, out of Festus's hands, so he doesn't have to deal with this anymore. He doesn't have to pass judgment. This is not his, in essence, this is not his business. So um, let's pick it up in uh, verse number 13, 25, 13. Festus discusses Paul now with King Agrippa, and Agrippa uh, uh, agrees to hear this case. Now, Agrippa had uh, greater insight into the Jewish aspects of these complaints, the religious and theological aspects of these complaints, because of his position and because of his heritage, his, his background himself. So 2513, and after certain days, King Agrippa and Bernice came unto Caesarea to salute Festus. And when they had been there many days, Festus declared Paul's cause unto the king, saying, there's a certain man left in bonds by Felix, that was Festus's predecessor, remember, about whom, when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me, desiring to have judgment against him. To whom I answered, it is not the manner of the Romans to deliver any man to die. Before that, he which is accused have the accusers face to face and have license to answer for himself concerning the crime laid against him. Now those are some good uh, judicial principles right there. The accuser is to bring charges face to face to the accused. That's the right thing to do, no question about it. And then it says that the accused individual has the freedom or the license to answer for himself. He can speak for himself, so he gets a chance to defend himself. Those are good principles of jurisprudence for sure. Concerning the crime laid against him, verse 17, therefore... When they were come thither, or hither, without any delay on the morrow, I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought forth. Against whom? When the accusers stood up, they brought none, none accusation of such things as I supposed. The things they talked about were really none of my business, but had certain questions against him of their own superstition, religious questions. Remember, this is a Roman he sees all this stuff as, you know, superstitious spiritism. This is stuff that doesn't concern him whatsoever. And of one Jesus, which was dead, but whom Paul affirmed to be alive. Basically, that's what this disagreement is all about. And because I doubted of such manner of questions, I asked him whether he would go to Jerusalem and there be judged of these matters. But when Paul had appealed to be reserved unto the hearing of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I might send him to Caesar. He has the right to appeal to Caesar. That's what he did, and I will uh, follow his directive accordingly. Then Agrippa said unto Festus, I would also hear the man myself. Tomorrow, said he, thou shalt hear him. So that's what takes place. Now Paul has a, another opportunity to witness. This thing just really snowballs. You can see all the different groups of individuals that Paul gets the opportunity to stand before. Religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, the high priest, and other Jews, obviously, who were negative in their opinion to, to uh, uh, the gospel. He also had the opportunity to stand before uh, the governor and the chief captain and soldiers, and he had audiences with all of these people. 
And this just continues uh, to snowball. Next is that Paul's going to get a chance to stand before Agrippa. So 25, 23 on page 283, if you would look there with me in your notes. 25, 23 says, And on the morrow, when Agrippa was come, and Bernice with great pomp, and was entered into the place of hearing with the chief captains, plural, and principal men of the city, I mean, these are the, these are the movers and shakers of the town, at Festus' commandment, Paul was brought forth. What an audience that, he, uh, that has been assembled by Festus for Paul the Apostle. You talk about witnessing opportunities, just absolutely incredible for Paul the Apostle. All right, and Festus said, King Agrippa, and all men which are here present with us, verse 24, ye see this man about whom all the multitude of the Jews have dealt with me, both at Jerusalem and also here, crying that he ought not to live any longer. They want him dead over the, this religious controversy. But when I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, that's Festus' opinion, he, he's the uh, uh, chief uh, government official, and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I have determined to send him, of whom I have no certain thing to write unto my Lord. Wherefore, I have brought him forth before you, and especially before thee, O King Agrippa, that after examination had, I might have somewhat to write. I, I'm supposed to send a letter with this individual on his trip to, uh, to uh, stand before Augustus Caesar. But frankly, I don't even know what to write down. I am just, I'm in the dark totally about this controversy that's going on here between these Jewish people and Paul the Apostle. I don't have a clue. Now, Herod, you have a background in the Jewish religion. You understand the history. You understand these things. Maybe you can give me some insight to help me write something that's reasonably intelligent when I send him off to Rome to stand before Augustus Caesar. In Festus' eyes, Paul had done nothing wrong according to Roman law, and therefore to send Paul to Caesar without... With, to, to Caesar without any charges, seem totally irrational. That's why Agrippa is brought in. So, in Festus' mind, uh, the whole controversy just didn't make any sense whatsoever. So, uh, Paul gets another opportunity to witness. So let's look at the uh, uh, page number 284 at the top there. We have some application here of this text. All of us will be judged in two kingdoms. Two kingdoms. There's a kingdom of God and there's a kingdom of men. The kingdom of man or the kingdoms of this world is maybe another term, a biblical term that we could use. We've got the kingdom of God. We've got the kingdom of heaven. And I don't have time to go in and define the difference between the two of those. But there is, I believe, a difference between the two of them. And then the third would be the kingdoms of this world. And of course, there is uh, Satan, is the, he is the, uh, uh, the individual who rules over the, he is the God of this world, as 2 Corinthians chapter says, rules over the kingdoms of this world. But we will be judged in two kingdoms. You're going to be judged by people, human beings, and you're going to be judged by God himself. And we need to be careful that we're much more concerned about what God thinks about us and what we think about God than what we think about this world. Now, that doesn't mean that you've got to be uh, uh, sarcastic all the time. It doesn't mean that you have to be cynical about everything that's going on in the world. There's enough bad stuff, as we know, going on in the world. We can watch it on television, read about it in newspapers, on the Internet, and stuff like that. There's plenty of bad stuff going on. Frankly, I uh, encourage you to protect yourself from most of it or all of it if you can do that. But we will be judged in this world, and basically the judgment that's, that's directed at us as individuals will afford us an opportunity to speak up 
uh, or not to speak up. We need to be seen as people who are credible and believable. And that's what Paul the Apostle is working on here. He's trying to, he is trying his very best to be credible in everything he says. He's very careful about what he declares to be true and what he doesn't touch whatsoever. Consequently, the Roman uh, official, Festus, he listens to him and he says, I don't see anything wrong with this guy. He was purely theological. And he had every right, as far as Festus was concerned, to believe religiously whatever he believed and, prof and propagate that, so to speak, as long as he wasn't a troublemaker. He could disagree with people, but it wasn't Festus's business to deal with it. Number two, <clears throat> obstacles again present opportunities. The obstacles that were presented or put before uh, the apostle all resulted in great opportunities for him to witness to groups of people that would be, you know, just to make an appointment with the Sanhedrin and say, I want to come over and witness to you guys and tell you about Jesus. That isn't going to happen. But God had a way of working out the details and circumstances of life. And God prophesied, you're going to stand before important people, Paul, before kings, before leaders. You're going to do it. And God made sure that he did. And he's on his way to the emperor of the Roman Empire. The world in which we live is backward, upside down. Don't let it discourage you. I heard a message recently by a preacher, and, and um, this know also, in the last days, perilous times shall come. That's where he started his message. And in his message, he brought out, you know, a lot of the, just the stuff that is um, distressing and depressing to Christians. And uh, the point of his message was that, was that we're going to have to be strong. Uh, we're going to have to be tough. Uh, we're going to have to know what we believe, why we believe it, and we're going to have to stick to our guns, so to speak, something like that. We're going to have to be tough. And the message is a good message, and it certainly was true, and everything that he was saying was true. But he brought up in, the, in, in his message the analogy of Jesus in the boat in the storm. And Jesus was in the boat, and the storm was raging all around the disciples. And, of course, the disciples got their eyes on the storm, and Jesus was asleep in the boat. He was at peace. I think sometimes what we have to do, a bit of advice, this is not critical of those who bring out the worst in humanity and the worst in our world, the uh, doomsday prophets. It's not, this is not a statement against them. But I am saying this. You need to focus on the peace of the Savior in the boat. You can't just sit around looking at all the storm clouds. It'll drive you absolutely loony. What we need to do is we need to find a place of peace next to the Savior inside the boat and maybe take a nap with him once in a while, if you know what I mean. Find peace in the boat instead of all the turmoil of the storms that rage around us. Just some encouragement. Human bodies of law, number four on 284, human bodies of law are only as good as they reflect the truth and justice of God. And there's some good things as we pointed out in this. Righteous judgment brings healing and peace. Sometimes the heathen have a better sense of justice than the religious. Certainly in the story that we just read, the religious just wanted to assassinate, get rid of Paul the Apostle, whereas the Romans... Uh, had common sense about this. And then the only judgment that truly matters in the end is God's judgment. All judges will stand before him, will stand before him. All right, we continue here as we study through the, these uh, latter chapters of the book. The next chapter probably <clears throat> is the pinnacle, the highlight, of the whole book. Uh, I entitled the next lesson, The Life of a Disciple. And what we're going to get in chapter number 26 is Paul is going to have an opportunity once again to bring his testimony. 
And this may be the most powerful sermon that Paul preached in the whole book of the book of Acts. So there's 32 verses in that chapter. We're going to take a break right now and we're going to come back and we will then go through the narrative of Acts chapter number 26. Let's take a break.